this is kind of where some of my ideas come from. I, I'm, I'm doing these moment shots. Uh, and I'll explain more on the moment shots once I get over to the back. And this is the very first one I made. Uh, this was just something I was playing with. Uh, that was called the Bird of Paradise. And then it evolved to this bird, uh, the Looney Bird. Uh, both of those pieces sold within uh, a day. This one's here with me. That's a, a, a piece I've maintained and haven't offered for sale because it's going to Louisville. And this one's in the regional arts competition here locally. Uh, I believe it did win a prize. And these are, are, are three that I really kind of started with. And I was just making the shapes and playing. And as I, I got further into it, I thought, boy, they sure look nice with faces. So I added the faces. And you know, again here, you can see the roundness in the body. That's a turning. And then I'll look at the thickness of the neck and the length of the neck, the length of the head and beak and the width of the head. The head is usually about one third the size of the body in most of these birds I'm looking at. And you can see the round body here, okay? And then the neck here and the head, and you just kind of straighten that out and you get an idea of where you're going. This one really hit me. I like this bird. It's kind of what I copied. Uh, well, I thought I had these in rotation. Oh, here we go. So you can see I outlined the bird here. And I will go back then and make a tracing of that bird several times. So here you can see I kind of drew a center line through here have an idea of what the body's gonna look like. The neck is gonna come clear out to here and the beak would be off the page. So I, I had to go back and redo this. Here I have two pieces of paper together and I did straighten out the neck, got approximately the same length, got my head size. It's about one third the size of the body, maybe a little less. And I exaggerated the beak. There's a cutout from it. I'll do three or four cutouts and I'll start to fold these lines to give me an idea of the angle and where it's going. Part of the problem is we're working in 2D here, but we have to convert it to 3D. And it gets a little confusing. Uh, that's why I have several cutouts so I can reshape it and I'll get an approximate angle of where I'm going with the head. And there it is turned. And with the tracing laying next to it, I did add some feathers back here. And I'll explain that. And this is basically what I start. This is one without a head. Okay, it's just a cone, similar to the very first one I did. There's the different cuts I made trying to get my angle. And this is really what I settled on. This is what I wanted. I, I wanted it to look like the bird was printing itself. And you do it on 2D, you, that has to overlap. And, and with this, you can turn the angle to the head wherever you want it to go. This one has multiple feathers and that's sitting over here. It's about two thirds done. You don't fasten the head until you've done all your carving, all your wood burning and all your painting. Otherwise you can't get in here and work. So I, I pulled the heads back. I did end up cutting off this tail. I really wasn't sure where I wanted to go with it. This is the bird uh, that's set on the fence pole. And you can see all the angles. I drew a red line on the top, a blue line on the bottom. So I know that in 2D, I can roll those over and have them 180 degrees to each other. There's the bird next to the cutout. This is a cutout for it to sit on the on the fence post. And there it is sitting. So I had to go back here to carve this out, carve the back side of this so I could slide that in and hide everything. And I think with every face, that's where it's at. Now that is real blood, okay? Uh, if you don't if you don't bleed on a piece, you haven't worked on it, okay? Uh, 
This is one of my sanding tools to do the interior curve here. This is by Peter Blair. I, Peter was going to join us this morning. I don't know if he's on. These are the cup cutters I use to make the eyeballs, and they come in various sizes. Um, and that's a Deerfoot brush. So well, let's go back over, Pete, to the overhead. And I'll go over here and get you started. I'm sorry, Ron, what kind of brush is that? You, I didn't hear that. What kind of brush? Uh, that was a Deerfoot brush. Uh, those are fairly expensive. You get them out of Dick Blick. Uh, that brush was $40. That's the only expensive. Well, I got two more of them. Uh, they are actually used in the jewelry business for the ends of wires. And we're overhead here. Yep. These are right here, okay. And they have serrations in the center. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, you should be able to do this one pretty dirty. And what you have to do when you get these in is sharpen them because in the jewelry business, they're not using the edges, okay? They're pushing the, the wire in and kind of burnishing the inside, I guess. Here, I want to expose the teeth so it doesn't skate on me. If I don't expose the teeth, it's going to skate. It's going to be hard to control and put the eyes where I want them. Um, this one was freshly sharpened. This one is used. We, I'll, I'll burn some eyeballs in later. Pass those around, Jeff. Um, the, the tool list is on the handout, and it's a nine or 10 page handout where I cover everything top to bottom, including the burning and the painting. Um, I'm probably going to get a little lost in this. It's the first time I've done this demo. Let's start with the drawing. And you saw the drawing. So I've gone out now and I've created different angles. Don't hear me, I think I lost thing. So when I start with playing, this is what I played with. Okay, Dalla. Here, the microphone is not on the house. There we go. Better? Yes. So we're looking at 5 degrees, 10 degrees, 15 degrees, and 20 degrees. So I just kept playing with it and uh, came back to play with something like this. And this is fun. Yep. And that's actually glued together. Um, this, these pieces are not glued together. You can see I even numbered these. So I can go back and straighten the piece up and see where I started, what I had, how I played with it. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting to do, quite honestly. Um, so let's say I've got a good idea of what I'm going to turn. I've already made my tracing. So then I'm going to actually turn the piece. Take this head off for a minute. That off. That's the... Uh, Oops. So this is kind of what I started with, okay? So now I have to look at my drawings where I made my cuts and say, hey, I want to try and duplicate that cut. Now, going through the bandsaw with something wrong is just terrible to hold on to. It's going to want to spin on me. So I made a jig. And if I say I made a jig, uh, I brought four different ones with, okay? Because you're cutting them apart. You can see here, I made a cut into here. That's about 20 degrees. The one I used the most, I had all the angles marked on it, but I've cut it so many times it came apart. So to help me hold this, I have Turner's tape. How many of you have used Turner's tape? 
The stuff is unbelievable when you seal it up and you really get it tight. So it prevents the spinning. And I'll start, the thing I like to do, like this must be the cut I use to make this cup. Okay. I can follow the angle. Now I know when I turn it 180 degrees, it's going to be straight up and down. Is anyone else having trouble hearing? Yes. You're All right. I guess yes, indeed. Okay. This one is also got double sided tape on both sides. This is for real narrow pieces that I might want to just stick to there and run it through so it, it doesn't roll on me going through the bandsaw and my fingers are out of the way. I've actually had it to the point where I couldn't hardly get the piece off the double sided tape at that point. Now I've made my first cut and I can't get this apart. I need to. Anybody got a blade, a knife? Yeah, good tape. Thanks, George. So we'll open this up. We'll turn it 180 degrees. All I have to do is get it started. Yeah. Yeah. So now we go 180 degrees. Okay. So that gets me started. Now, if you notice, I didn't put a bottom on this because I don't know the exact angle of the head, where the head's going to go. Uh, you know, this one is, is completely different. Uh, I, I didn't go as deep into the body here as I did here. Um, it just, to be honest with you, just have fun and play with it. You know, this is my ginkgo bird. This will all get feathered out. Um, so now uh, I got an idea where I'm going here. So now I have to go back over the saw and I would cut this apart, change the angle, and then I'd start building. Now, this is important to use tape here because once I've decided where the head's going to go, what angle, what do I want it to be doing? Uh, this bird was was singing at first light, so I wanted the head going up. I am finding it very difficult to follow what he's doing. Uh, it's, yeah, it is difficult. And I'll be honest with you, there's times when it's difficult to get the concept, uh, but you're kind of looking at nature through a jaundice eye of a wood turn. Oh, gotcha. I, I think we're having some technical difficulties with our uh, with our internet connection. So I know that makes it difficult, especially if I'm breaking up or you don't hear me well. And, and I apologize for that. But just to, just to, to check, you turn off those lights. Just the, the ones that are not the table. Okay, that, that does not happen. No. No. Well, the overheads, we were kind of looking at those last week. Yeah. This seemed to be the best. Yeah, it did. And I thought last night it looked good. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful you all can hear me. I'm, I think I'm projecting as well as I can. Uh, we can hear your findings here. So if they can't tell over the internet from this, we're just doing this off of a phone right now because we can't get internet connection. Right. right. We don't have our typical internet connection. 
Uh, and this is being recorded. It will be edited and on our YouTube channel. So you can go back and review this. Uh, you know, Mummenschanz uh, is, is a German word for mummery. And uh, in 1972, the Swiss did a Mummenschanz theater troupe, and that kind of kicked everything off for this. And I, I enjoyed it and seeing some of this, this, this different shapes. Uh, here, right now, you can see the birds looking upward, but I did make a, a cut uh, about halfway through the head because I, I, I know I don't want this bird looking upward. So what I did is I'm gonna move this head back around like this. And I think if you look at the photos of my other birds and my other work, you're gonna to wanna to see attitude in the in the face. And I think that's what draws people in. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm gonna mount this one. I may cut it out as I did this one. So it will set on something. And I don't think you can see, I've got a little bit of a gap here. Uh, but that I probably got a couple hours just on making that fit. Uh, this particular moment shots was one of the first ones I made. Uh, it was dropped the other day and broke. You can see the line here. Um, this was textured with a MAMPA tool. I don't know if any of you are familiar with MAMPA tools, but they make a lot of uh, carbide tools. This one's one of the best cutters I've seen here, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> So now after I position this and, and I, I get my heads where I want, the next step, I have to mark a center line through the bird. Now I'd like to do it out here. There's a center line, center line. There's nothing worse than building one of these and you get it all glued up and it won't stand up or it isn't where you want it, the shape to be. So you mark these, okay? Now I've got a center line, so when I take all this apart and lay it out, hopefully George is the last time I'll need it. So now I'm gonna pull my tape off. Turner's double-sided tape available at Woodcraft. Um, hey, Ron. Yeah. Hey, Ron. Could you, um, do you have a couple of cut pieces that you could show how you go from, how you rotate the pieces to get the curve in the neck, just real quick? Yeah, I mean, let me take all the tape off. Of the, that was Dave. Thanks. All right, hang on. Uh, so now, go back to here. So this was the, the basic shape, and this is on here, okay? And so I've got a bird over there. These were all straight, okay? This is kind of what I started with. Same with these, okay? These are the uncut versions. Uh, one thing, I, and I do have instructions on all of this from start to beginning, even dry brush painting and wood burning. Now that the one that's, the bird that's sitting on the fence post, I timed myself for the very first time I got 56 hours, in, okay? And it has one, two, three, three, four rows of feathers. This one has four rows of feathers. So each one of those will get carved. The body on this one is going to get cut through here. Okay, this is going to be one of the shortest necks I've made. This is a little longer neck, smaller body, and that'll get cut somewhere through here. This will come off, obviously, 
does the other. Once I get these cut apart and I put them back together with the tape, I have already marked my center lines. Let me get this tape off of the head. No. No, uh, uh, thank you. I'm using a bandsaw. I want the cleanest cut I can get. So I'm using six TPI 3 8 blade. And it's a brand new blade. I, and I only use it to cut these apart. I don't want to ruin that blade. Now, I've got four of those blades, so I have plenty. Um, it makes a clean cut after I cut it. And before I really piece it together, I'll sand these, okay? I want to try and get these as flat as I can because it makes for a better feel. Uh, got a little tape on that. So we're going to take that off. When you do the I quite often number my pieces, especially when it comes into the neck. If I've got a real long neck piece, I've got one piece uh, that I made from a baseball billet, that billet, and it spans 30 inches tall. When I finally got it done, it wouldn't stand up. So, again, back to the bandsaw, and, and you make it stand up. Um, so this is, is going to get glued together based on my center line. Okay. We use type bond, quick and thick. Uh, the stuff is magic. Okay. Now, the first thought most of the time is I'll just use CA glue. If you touch these together with CA glue, you better be dead on the first time you do it. Okay, here I've got time to play around a little, move it around, and get it in the position I want it. Now, this is the greatest school. Yeah, if it dries clear too. So it's white yeah. now, but it dries clear. It dries clear. It just one to use, and I can already feel it starting to tighten up. And the more pressure I put on it, the faster it seems to set up. Okay. Now, when I set these, set these up, I want to line this as good as I can get it. These are the hardest areas to sand is this. This is going to get knocked off and rounded over and as good a seam as I want. There we go. So in about five minutes, I'd be able to work on this piece. And you just keep building from here. This is the other piece. This is the nice part is once you have a good idea where you're going. Hopefully, there we go. It starts to tighten up. Now I've got my center line lined up. Let that dry for a minute. Uh, the turning of these is about as basic as it gets. Everybody here can turn an ice cream cone or turn this particular shape. Okay. It's it's getting especially on this piece, the head and the body, the right size. Um, it can be a lot of fun, but then it, it, it can be totally out of proportion. You can see I've got a line here. I'm not happy with the taper from here, which is going to be the body to the head. Okay, I would like to, I'm going to narrow this from here. Uh, this is too big for a head, at least for for me. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I do keep the tenon on. Uh, 
I've never gone back to turn one. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe I did go back. Uh, I, but I didn't turn it. Uh, on the uh, ugly on the river that's in the uh, regional right now, the neck was totally disproportionate to too tall. So at that point, if I left them standing, the neck was about that long. So what I did is just went in, cut it all apart, angled the head, and it looked fantastic. So no, I've never really gone back and turned it on. Now, if you look at what we have here, here, here. That's another thing. Don't lose one of these parts. <laughs> I had one roll away from me and went under a little tray. And I went freaking crazy. I'm thinking, it's got to be here. It finally showed up. But these are, these are the different images in my mind. Now, keep in mind, when we're doing this, we're, we're not making decoys. I don't want to be a bird car. There's nothing here that looks realistic. And i that's my intention. This is about fun. This is Disneyland, okay? You know, I, I stepped out of bounds a few years back trying to do more artistic fun than round and brown. And this is, you know, after 14 years, this is where I kind of ended up, okay? And when I, I took a chance for me, not knowing if they're going to be a commercial success. And that was some of the concern. But something I left out of the paperwork, and it was not intentional. I say that because I was on uh, a, a, a group called Wild World Wood Turn, and somebody had mentioned, as a demonstrator, they only give up 80 to 90% of what they do. I think that's criminal, okay? So I'm going to tell you how I do the feathers, but I forgot to write it. I'm not, I don't want to intentionally leave it out, okay? These are done with a diamond carbide. And you're sticking that diamond carbide in each one of these slots to make these different wings. Now these I made real short. This, this might be a mistake. Uh, I think I had another short one. I can't keep my birds. Okay. They sell, you know, I've got a waiting list now. I've got four commissions. Um, but that's how I do the wings. You badly undercut. This one's wrong because I tried to undercut too far. I've got too much wing exposure here, and the distance is too great. So, what I'll do is I'll carve almost all of this out. I'll bring these feathers. This top will come all the way out to here. This will be the tail feathers. This will be gone right there. Okay, so I'll curve that down, carve that out, extend the feather, and I'll extend the feathers down here. I did that. Oh. Well, there's one the part where your mic's not going to be. Yeah, everybody hear me now. So, you can see here, I didn't have a head of that. You can't see. It's not coming through. You couldn't hear it. We could hear you better before the adjustment. Yeah, sir. Breaking up now. Something else, if you're going to build a bird, you're going to find this is the hardest area to work in. 
And I, I use that, that tool I showed you earlier in the video. Um, so this is, is a tool from Peter Blair. Uh, this helps me get into these tight corners. It's real cushy. Okay, it runs off my Fordham. Uh, I have a couple of different sizes of these. You can also get these from uh, Woodcraft. Okay, smaller, it fit the Dremel. But the tighter this curve is here, the more difficult it is to work. And where it really gets difficult, I don't know if you can see down in here, this hasn't been wood burned yet. I've got to bend a wire to be able to get up under there to make this. And something else I've learned as I progress through this is I might take this now and sand it before I get trapped inside. Now I have a little more work room, so I'll sand this and I'll get my curve started here. This I don't worry about. I'll, that I can knock off anytime. I'll show you how I do that. Um, in fact, we can do that right here, right now. I use uh, a couple different tools. This happens to be a proc, uh, you know, proxon uh, belt sander miniature. I've had this for decades. The only thing I don't like about it is it does heat up. I think all proxon tools do. Now, this is going to be noisy and dusty. I'm not going to do a lot of this, so I'll give you the basics. Uh, that's rock solid already. The thing I like about this, we're over here, is see the movement. I can see my, my saw or my sander, and I can see it moving, okay? So I start to round these over. Now with most of these pieces, I work pretty hard to try and get them fairly fluid looking. I think this one's Pretty fluid looking, okay? It's got a curve to it here, curve there, nice inside curve. Um, it's hours of either sanding and or carving those lumps out of it. Uh, I prefer to sand them out. I think every one of these has been sanded. Um, this one I know I did sand. There are times that these creases are going to come back out, that you're going to see them. And it's going to come when you wood burn. And it's really strange that when, when you start to wood burn, the heat follows the straws, right? So I can be wood burning back here, and out of this end, I'm getting smoke, okay? It's transferring the smoke, but it's also transferring the heat. So what you have to do I can find one up here. Uh, it will force the glue out. So you want to go back in and scrape that glue out of it. Just from right here. I don't think you can see it. And that's all I do. Scrape that out of it. Now I'm going to do enough wood burning and carving and distorting. It's it's going to be difficult to see, okay? Um, this piece is not fully wood burned, but I've knocked, you can see the curve, okay? So I knocked all those high spots off. I did what I could to get this rounded out, and then I'll start wood burning. Um, I'll burn some feathers. Okay. I've got a razor tip with the A, uh, 
the protocol of I'm running, I have six. Okay. Temperature wise, this is cherry. I think everything I've made to date is either been maple or cherry. Uh, Pardon? I'm using a razor tip, uh, SSD 10 with the spade bed. Uh, I'm at six. Now, I like both elbows on the table. I want one hand supporting the other hand. And I also need my cheaters. Come with age. I learned it. So we're just going to. What I'm going to try to do is set up. Now you see I'm not burning all the way together. Feathers have a quill in them. A lot of people who carve will put a line all the way down through on each side of what would be the quill. I don't like that line. I like the emptiness because it takes the shine better. Well, let's look at this. Can you see this? Okay. I could have put a line through here, through here, brought it to a point. And there's just something about those two lines I don't like, but I do like what this does. Okay, this will take a color differently than this. Every one of these birds has at least five colors on it, and generally somewhere around 20 coats of paint. Dry bow. So we'll go back and burn some more of this. Being able to steady myself makes a world of difference. I would like my lines to be as close together as I can. And at certain times, I get a rhythm going, and it really works. Everybody's still away. So this is a, kind of a precursor to the retreat. We will be making these at the retreat. Um, it'll be an all-day class. The bird on the fence post that I have with me, for the very first time in 14 years, I got to think about answering the question, how long did that take? So every time I sat down, I put a time on it. 56 hours. Oh, Jesus. I'm not happy with the quill on this one. I'm going to bring it a little closer together. Okay, so you can see how many hours of carving, turning, and burning I'm doing. The turning is minutes compared to the rest of this. Okay, I, I just in the evening I'll sit down in the dining room and just do the wood burning. And I enjoy it. I, I want to be in the house. So let's go back to here. Now, I design on the fly, okay? I'm not an artist, so I can't hardly really draw a straight line. So my drawings, is, as you saw, all are coming off of photographs. Something I did in the early years was vital photography. And this, this goes on for hours. And I listen to music. Um, I listen to about anything. Um, this is the start of it. Now, on um, this moment, Sean, so this is one of the first ones I did. Let me turn my thought. This is all the little dots you see there are done with another wood burner. And it's nothing more than a couple wires 
uh, they come together and uh, get red hot. Uh, this I'll turn up all the way. Uh, I'm going to run this as high as I can run it. And hopefully it burns quickly. Let's take one of these. And I'll start burning. Uh, if you notice, there were areas that were unburned. Okay. See these lines? That's the, the original finish. I, I would burn the rondo to put those in. Then I went back with a very small brush and I brushed down metallic green. There's yellow and uh, four greens on here. So I like to do different patterns within each one of these, even though I've got another pattern here. You can use the to make patterns. So, Now, uh, home. Oh, this, now I want you to look down here. Uh, look at the very bottom when I burn. See the smoke coming out? So that's the heat that's being transferred and the smoke, which will have a little havoc on our glue joints when we start to, to glue things up and put it together. Not doing it much now. There it did. And you can see it comes out the bottom. So it's transferring the heat and the smoke to my joints. But the joints stay tight and you just go back with your, your thumbnail and you take out the excess glue that's boiled out of it. Wow. Okay. It takes care of some of the wood from it. And this is literally hours and hours of burning. Yeah. How long do I leave it set before I work it? Yeah. Uh, I start working with it immediately. Okay, like here, this is all workable. I got a bit, I get off the money here quite a bit, so that'll be quite a bit of grinding. Uh, and that's where either the proxon or the uh, Peter Blair, this is the, the contour tool. So I'll come back after it like this. No, I mean, yeah, I'll probably sit a day or two uh, before I get to it. Uh, all these pieces that you see here will all go into work and be worked on at the same time. Uh, once I get them close to being assembled, you know, that's that's only the start of it. So I like to do things in steps and, and different steps so that I can keep track of where I'm going and what my intention might be. But once they're glued up, it's almost mechanical. I mean, it, it, first, then I'm gonna draw a pattern onto these similar as to what I do on here. Uh, if this was cut apart, I would come across here. And let's say my body is cut here, okay? Uh -huh. I've got this. So I'm undercut here. I know I can have some feathers here. So I'm going to come out of here, and I'm going to round it off like that, okay? Then I'm going to decide, you know, maybe generally I do them this way. Okay. And I bring them together down here. I'm going to bring this one down even further. The question then comes up, how's the bird going to stand? Where are you going to cut it out at? Um, see the cut I made in this one. So I could have it stand up on something. And I wasn't sure yet what it was going to be. But I didn't do that until I had 90% of the work done on this. So it could have been a costly mistake if I couldn't make this work. 
but I it set the piece apart from all the other pieces I've made. That's just double-sided tape right now. And you can see where I carved it out here. I had a really good fit here, but as I started to torch this, I didn't realize I had that much wind blowing in the shop. So I turned the torch off, set it down, and I smelled wood burning. Well, the wind caught this. It was still hot and burned it out from underneath it. But I can, it still fits good. Yeah, <laughs> the stupid mistakes, isn't it? Additional hazards, huh? Turning. Uh, so yeah, then I'll come back to this side. I'll go from here to here, and I'll draw that around. Probably that around like this. I'll come back to here. Draw that off to there. Draw What's the purpose of the lines? Is it guidance for for the for the burning? Yeah. No. Well. Before I burn, I'm going to go back with my microcarver and I'm going to carve those edges out. Okay. Um, okay. I, I'm sorry. I jumped the gun. I, thanks. <laughs> Usually, I would use a steel uh, cutter. I don't know what, what it's called for sure. Right here. Um, I'll use this one. Yeah, no. Hmm. I'm not going to show you a car. Sorry, guys. Not here we go. Just what I want. Uh, I have one for everybody, but it'll come in email. Okay. I have three copies here. If some of you don't do email, PDF, and printing. Have that. So now that I have my basic line. I'm going to come back. Make a white cut to get started. I'm getting fairly straight on. I do apologize. I'm hard of hearing. Uh, okay. So that's the basic. I would go deeper than that. Uh, I would also now take sandpaper. And, and try and sand that back, okay, the best I can. It gets more difficult to tighter the quarters, um, but this was all sanded back, and this gives you a, a, an idea of the depth, and it's not a lot. There's other ways to undercut to make a feather stand out. Let's see where I'm at here. I can undercut this one. And play. And I did that on this, this particular group here, the uh, first time, first white product. I want to get some white back on. Can you speak that around? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to superheat this. And I want to take right through here, I want to take this out of here. Now, I, I would probably start it on most cases, but I want to do a couple so I'm actually sliding my blade underneath that feather. Right? Now I do this in the dining room. I just have a fan 
drive right into the uh, box. They're unbelievable. And when he does these little ones, he'll also take a carving board, and you can't tell which one is negative, down, and which one is up. It's really fascinating to look at his work. Uh, I enjoy using these, uh, using them in others. Bernie's also. We'll pass that on to us to look good. You are burning. You are not disgusting. One of the things I've noticed with the cup cutters is that you can get a carbon buildup on the inside of them and you've got to clean out the flutes. And when the carbon buildup happens, your eyeballs are no longer going to be round. They get to be cone shaped and they look kind of weird. So check your check your cup cutters regularly because if you're doing a lot of burning eye cutting with them, they can get the carbon buildup on the inside. I have also this brass brass, and you'll see why. There's a carbon buildup in these that's just incredible. I've got a cutter on here, okay, and I've used it twice, but there's still teeth sticking out. So I'm going to put the eyeball above here. Usually, I think I might want to salvage this. I've got customers waiting. Now, what that will do, too, is allow me to rotate a little bit. I'm going to run this for them at full blast. And you got an oversized apple. Now, Michael Key's demonstration in Chicago. Panic set in as it floated up towards a smoke alarm. Okay? So they quickly went and got fans. So let's burn this other size. This I do not do in the kitchen. There you go. The two eyes looking at you. Okay. Now, generally, I would dot paint these. Okay, when I'm done. Every moment shots I've made has yellow eyes. Okay. And I don't know why I picked it. I want it to stand out. I'd like people to see the eyeballs from across the room. Okay. Because they're against a, a black background. Um, I'm sorry. Where? Uh, MDI wood carvers. Uh, it's on the it's on the paperwork. Uh, Mampa Tools is on there. I haven't shown you the Mampa yet. I, I love this tool. It's the cleanest cutting texturing tool I've ever used. Uh, there's two of them. I was using a rotary chisel in the past, and then and Fred Gallegos turned me on to these cuttings. Those aren't heated, it's just the friction methods. These, yeah, that's just friction, but there are grooves in there to help build up the removal, okay? And I'll, after a couple of those, I'm going to have to run and clean that out take it back over to my CBN to, to sharpen that. I'll take this over to my CBN wheel while it's running, and I will run this at a high speed and just touch against there to make it shine. Once it shines, I want to make sure I can feel teeth out here. And I, I think on the one that I had sharpened, it had looked good. Uh, you saw a good shiny edge on it. That tells me I, you know, I must have recently sharpened it. So this is a Mampa, okay? This is a Mampa diamond. And 
don't know where that little green job went. That's what all that texturing was done with. Then they also make it with a round uh, shear cut cutter. These are both carbide cutters. No, we do not sell them. No, I have no intention of them. Uh, this cuts cleaner than anything I've ever cut. And they're little bitty triangular diamond shape. And you can rotate them. Uh, I thought the screw was small in our hogger. It's big compared to this. I don't I don't know the size of this, but it's it's extremely small. We use a two uh, M two and a half on our shear cut cutters, but this is smaller than that. Um, Forty five dollars a piece, something like that. I mean, I'm I'm not going to use them today. Um, but I do texture with those. I love them because they clean cut. To clean up some of the debris off of these. Yeah, sure. Even this, this was cut with the round. Okay, and you can see it, it kind of fits in these grooves. This doesn't cut quite as clean. There's kind of a bristle brush that goes on on um, a Dremel tool. I don't even think that has one of yours. But that cleans it up. It takes off that that little bit of fuzz that you're gonna get off of these. And it's 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 fun. It's it's a great way to texture. Uh, I think most people have left rotary chisel to go to these. Uh, I think they're a little less expensive. The tips are interchangeable. I, I haven't priced them. I will tell you this, the cutters will last just forever. Uh, in fact, if you want, Jeff, if you want to pass these around. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd prefer they come back to me, okay. Uh, so that, that's some of the texturing. So now at this point, let's say, and this bird's, I think this bird's further along. You can see this side I painted black, okay? Whenever you're going to do dry brush painting, you start with your darkest color. And then you build to your lightest color. And you can see I've got cordite for a tail. It is carvable. It's workable. I'm not done with this yet. I've got some other ideas for it. There is a big hump on the grapple table. So I painted it black now with, this one's India ink. Now some of my others, I found some new reflective paint. And that's what's on this particular bird, the morning bird. We discovered this the other day on another form. This particular paint has a high gloss and it almost reflects the light. So that's, in some of my cases, that's what I use instead of India ink. Um, this is also the same company. And that is a really nice color. It's shiny. Um, this is not as shiny. I like golden paint, although I don't have much of it. These are the colors that's on here, okay? That's um, all acrylics. Or, yeah, they're all acrylics, okay? Now the last one I put on, I don't have it with me. It again is a metallic. It looks white, okay? You paint it on and it turns pink, okay? So it's hard to imagine what your piece is gonna look like until it starts to dry. So I dry brush painted some of that over the top here, here, and here to try and pick up some light into the center vein of each one of these. So yeah, some of it was kind of hand painted. Some of it like up to here is dry brush painted. 
Okay, I didn't, I want a little weird color in there. Uh, I don't want anything that looks natural or normal. I want to be compared to somebody that's a poor art carver. But these are kind of the colors I use. And every one of these is on that blue room. Okay. And your choice of colors is important, plus the way you apply them. You don't want to fill in all of these little grooves that taking you weeks and hours to put in. Um, you could use some of the other stuff as some of the creams. I, I haven't tried the creams yet. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Something, you know, you can, the, the cuts and the angles are not so severe, okay? Good, you might want to tell people try the dry is. Yeah. Uh, Let's do this, Tom. The, uh, Tom asked. Sorry, uh, we couldn't hear the question. We couldn't hear the question. Could you repeat the Tom, question, Ron? Yeah, Tom asked about dry brush paint. What is it? How does it work? That kind of thing. Okay. So, must have left the power in the car. I generally towel off my paint on, on a towel. Uh, therefore, brush. All these other brushes probably cost a good five or six dollars. Okay. This was 40. Beautiful. Yeah. See the angle? Okay. Um, Uh, then there are two more deer for it. Uh, I just took delivery on this week. I needed smaller ones so I can start to get into smaller, tighter areas. Okay. Now, so when you're doing dry brush painting, I wasn't sure if we'd get this far. Uh, I'm just, uh, this is my dark blue. So I'm going to start with my dark blue. So I can start building up my colors. You should do four or five different colors. You should do 20, 25 coats of paint. And just take your time and enjoy it. So I, I put just a dab on her. Take most of it off. If you can see paint, it's almost too much paint. Okay. So just a light touch over the top. That's actually more paint than I probably should put on at one time. Okay, pick up a little more. Yep. The whole point of the dry brushing is you want your brush and the paint on your brush to be hardly there. Uh, I've seen people and I've used paper towels to get the brush really dry. You just have a very light bit of paint on it and, and you're pushing it on the top, just like Ron's doing. I love my towel. I wipe it off on a towel. Okay. Because I want to get the majority of it off. Uh, here yep. I, I'm wiping it on my bean bag and I'm picking up almost nothing. So this literally is hours and hours for pain. But I find it somewhat relaxing, but way too much on that day. Now what happens if you get too much on and you fill in the cracks? You got more black paint, paint over the top of it. A friend told me that, okay? Uh, so that's one color. And that'll, that'll dry almost instantly. Because it's a dry brush. I'm gonna use a drop or two here. You don't want to get in a hurry on this process. You gotta remember this is gonna be a finished piece. 
Ron, what was the second paint you just added to the plate? That's an acrylic carabine. Uh, it's out of Walmart. It's my. I, I'm sorry. Was it a white or, or what? Is it a light paint or what? I, I didn't even see it. It's a uh, pale blue. It's, I think that's almost a, a turquoise now. Uh, okay. On a lot of things, I just love it. it it's a thank you. Now I'm going to go much wilder with this piece based on what I've got here. Okay, so I haven't really decided where this piece is going, but I know I have a customer waiting. So they've already been told they won't see this piece till maybe early August. There's too much going on in June. How many of you here are going to Louisville? Wow. I guess I won't see you in Louisville. <laughs> Uh, so these these pieces will go to Louisville. I'm, I'm looking forward to Louisville. Uh, I don't see AZ Carbide going to Portland. Looks like can't paint that side. As you can see, I'm not painted it black. Okay. Now, no, I don't have that bird. One of the birds I didn't paint black. I went totally dark navy blue. And these scenes here. Stay dark navy blue, and it was, it was really nice. So it doesn't have to be black, but most people who do dry draw start with a black base. I kind of like the other, but I stayed with this for a while. Uh, that's kind of what dry brush painting is, and the way it works. Um, I enjoy it, and you know, you sit back in the evening, uh, you have your adult beverage. And you just sit there, you know. I might listen to Johnny Cash or, you know, Tom T. Hall or something, just to to keep me tuned in right here to what I'm working on. So I've condensed this down. I don't know where we're at on time. Okay, I've condensed 56 hours of work down to just over an hour. It's it's in the dedication and the time. I never thought I'd have the patience to do something like this. Uh, through old age, I found myself doing smaller pieces and still find them to be rewarding and fun to do. Uh, I just, it's part of what I do. Again, I brace myself. So he's got a blue eye. And that I'll change the yellow later. Um, that takes a while to dry because it, it it is a fair amount of paint laying on top of a burnt surface which has been sealed, okay, from what's boiled out of the wood. Uh, I can do the same thing with these eyeballs. Um, but again, I've got to come back under here. I've got to do some carving. And I'll put a, a beak on it. Questions? Uh, uh, it's uh, yeah. Ron, did you say that you seal the wood before you start your dry brush painting? Dilute it. Am I what? Dilute it. Oh no, it's right out of the box. Okay. Uh, I would be afraid if you dilute it and get it too thin. It's going to saturate your brush. Okay. Uh, depends on the colors I'm using. I might not want it. Okay. You know, these two blues are similar. It tends to blend things a little. Okay. And I'll, I'll really do that on maybe on the last coat where I want a good shine on it. Uh, but no, it's right out of here. I don't clean the brush. If I was going from here to here, fine. If I'm going to white, it's got to be clean. You've got to start all over. Okay. Or the lighter color, let's say I go to yellow, uh, then I'll, I'll clean the brush. Usually I'll hit clear water here. That'll go into the brush, dirties the water, then I've got another one to clean it again, and another one. To how clean do I want? And a lot of times, I don't clean the brush 
until I'm done. Because I do like the blended colors. I mean, you look at, you know, especially this one and this, there, there's five colors make that up. There's about eight greens that make that up. And it just, what do I, where am I going? And, I, and I, I've got to be honest with you all, okay? There's times I sit down to do this. I have no freaking idea where I'm going, okay? But I'm going to enjoy the trip, and I'm going to let this thing evolve to its own way, okay? And when I make my cuts, I'm only making a few degrees difference, okay? That's at 90. And this is 80, okay? That's the most severe cut I make. Now, when I, let's say that I've got this skinny little neck sticking out here. This is new Turner's tape. When I go to do something real small, and I'll press that against there to run it through the bandsaw. I don't want it rolling over. A friend told me he had several kick off the lathe, but he was able to salvage it. I did find it. So it's about being safe because the bandsaw is still as soft. And I think the last beak I did on here, I did a knife, I'll pry it off the tape. Okay, that's how safe it is. You know, you could cut through it and both sides will stick right here. Um, questions, comments? Y'all been pretty quiet. Good job. Yeah. I, I know that it's, it's difficult when you come to a demo and there's no way, okay? And, and I knew that would be an issue. So there. The chips flew, okay? Uh, do you put a finish for your coat on top? I do not. I, I do not. I have it. I know. Something else I'm going to give you. Okay. That's um, the acrylic paint. Uh, this is a, the highly reflective paint. That's this paint. Okay. And I get that. That came out of Walmart. That's probably a $3 paint. But it has this high gloss to it. And when you put it on, it, it's kind of an iridescent color. The the pink one, which is actually white, uh, and it dries pink. It's it's really weird, but it, it does provide a color. So I have here patterns. If you if anybody wants to make one of these, you're welcome to the pattern. This is a pattern off of this bird. Let me put that on camera. Now, can you see it? No. Now, what I did here while I was working on the bird is I rounded this from here to here, okay? And I left this straight up and I cut through here. That's what gave me this ledge right here to decorate. So I've exaggerated some of those and cut through the head. This is a prime example. I cut through the head. Okay. Now what it did though is left me a flat spot down here. But I will decorate that and I'll wood burn that and it'll only a wood turner will see it. And now I've got a little rooster tie right here. Okay. Now the next step that I'm working on is taking Fordite and putting it in the collar through here. Or really what I'm working for is to put a peacock through here. I've got a five inch by eight inch piece of Fordite. It's the same colors that's in that Fordite. So when I turn it around, I'll mount it. And like I did here, I mounted the Fordite here, run it to the bandsaw, 
So it was safe to cut off. There wasn't hole in it. But that's the next step. So I have these kind of things here for all the birds I've made. So if anybody wants to fool with it and wants to pick one of these up, so, 